all, I just want to thank JJ and everyone at the for putting this together. Really excited to be here, and uh, thanks all for coming. Um, so I'm going to be talking mostly about uh, my country today, but I'm going to go a bit back to start with my family, namely my sister and myself. Lisa and myself, we were born just 18 months apart from each other. Um, we were actually born in the same hospital. It's one of those weird peculiarities of history, is that we were born in the same wing, on the same floor of the same hospital, on the same road in the same city, but we were born in two different countries. Lisa was born in what was then called German Southwest Africa. It was a former German colony ruled by the brutal apartheid regime. We've all heard the story. Regime explicitly based on white supremacy and racism. Whites owned all the businesses. Whites made all the laws. In my own city, Vinto, all ethnic groups that were classified as black had at one point been forcibly removed from their homes and moved to the outskirts of the city to a dry, barren place. They called it Katatura. It's Oshibamba for the place where we don't want to live. Of course, this kind of oppression doesn't come without resistance. And so, you know, after a couple of decades of, of fighting and, and rebellion, the South African government had to pull back. And in 1990, a new nation was born. And 11 months later, so was I. So I was born in the same hospital as my sister, but I was born in a new country, Namibia, land of the brave, as our national anthem proudly declared, whose blood waters our freedom. So the people who I grew up with, my generation, they call us the born free generation. The first generation who were born in, into a free country. And we get the chance to really write the history of this new nation. That's not to say that Namibia didn't have a history before, it goes back thousands of years, people have always been there, but the moment where the nation was first made is, is a pivotal milestone. It was the first time during resistance and, and, and the struggle for Namibia, it was the first time that all these disparate ethnic groups in the same region, Oshibambo, Herero, Nama, Damara, Basta, Afrikaners, Germans, Himbas, it was the first time they thought about what is Namibia? You know, how can we all find ourselves together in a common identity? And my generation kind of gets to decide what that identity means. It almost didn't happen that way, at least my involvement almost didn't happen. My dad's a, a business owner. He sells furniture, chairs, sofas, beds, etc. The day that independence came, he, he went up into the roof of his business. He sent all his employees home, not so that they could celebrate, but just in case. And he went up onto the roof and he watched as tens of thousands of people marched from Katatura into the city center to take ownership of the nation that was rightfully theirs and had been denied to them for so long. And the question on everyone's mind that day was, after decades of oppression, will there be violent retaliation? Wouldn't have surprised anyone. And so he was up on the roof to see whether anyone would come and try to loot uh, or burn down his livelihood. And um, when he was standing there, he must have thought about, you know, my mom and my sister, his young infant daughter at home, and they were waiting anxiously for him to get back, and he must have wondered whether this was a safe country to raise a child and a family. Luckily it was. Um, we've done really well, and it's, it's a beautiful country, and I love it. I mean, from the epic desert vistas to the infinite plains, you know, the giraffes and elephants walking around to the eagles so soaring in the air, it's just gorgeous. And the people are generous, and, and the pace of life is a lot less neurotic than it is over here. And it's, just to be there. But I tell the above story just to give a sense of how precarious the situation can sometimes be. You know, tensions have eased, but sometimes it just takes a little bit and all goes downhill, as many <coughs> Zimbabwean friends could tell you a story about. But I'm not going to bore you with all these stories of, of the challenges we have, because Americans get enough poverty porn and violent imagery when we talk about African nations. But we do have some challenges, and it was actually brought home to me at the CBS next to uh, Walmart in my sophomore year, first year actually, spring. I had to get some prescription medicine and it was a hot day, I was in a rush, so I ran over there and I, you know, I come up to the counter sweating and out of breath and I just say, I need this and that. And the pharmacist responds and I'm like, okay, that's a weird accent. I look up and there's a name tag, it says Fani. It's the most South African name you can think of. Fani Dupree or something like that. At the point, of, you know, I was just mildly amused by it, I thought it was kind of cool, you know, South African call out, but that later turned out to be a real turning point in my life. Um, because while initially I thought it was just cool, the more I thought about, uh, about him and, and other people like him, expatriates who weren't longer um, in their nations, the more I, I started getting a bit upset. Uh, now I don't know this, this individual story, but I know that in general so many African countries have all these skilled people just leaving. It's been a mass exodus. South Africa alone has lost 1.6 million people, each of which has lost the economy 10 
jobs. That's 60 million jobs in a country with an unemployment rate of 50% for young people. So it's not a drop in the bucket. And I got angry. I was, I was frustrated. I was like, why are you leaving your country? You know, you, your country's given you so much. And you just desert it. You're aiming the destruction of a place that's given you so much. You're a traitor. It's funny because up until that point, I didn't really know what I was going to do with my life. When I was a kid, I used to read my dad's business books and think, you know, I'd make money one day. Um, but as I started seeing how upset I was at all these people who had something to give and wouldn't give it, um, I started to realize, oh, well, you know, if I'm upset at people doing that, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I see my role as having to go back and contribute in some sort of way. There's a large contingent of people who will say that that kind of thought is hopeless. I was at the World Cup a couple of years ago in South Africa. Um, the World Cup is a really interesting place to be anywhere in Africa because as much as we hate people talking about Africa as if it's one place, during the World Cup we kind of all group together and we rally behind whoever has the best chance to beat the European teams. Right? There's, there's a common underdog unity that comes from that. And this time it was especially so because South Africa was hosting. The first time ever an African nation had got to host the World Cup. And there had been so many doubts leading up to it. You know, can they build the stadiums? Can they build the infrastructure? All of a sudden, there were doubts when South Africa was trying to do it. Unjustified doubts because it went over just well. But nonetheless, and so we all saw it as a bit of a vindication when it went so well. A lot of people around Africa saw it as the arrival on the world stage of, of a new African um, mighty nation. And so everyone was celebrating this achievement mightily. And we were out one night in the bars, and I remember talking to the, the man next to us at, at the bar. Um, a middle-aged black male, and, and as every, every conversation those days, we started talking about how amazing is this, how well did they pull this off, and while everyone around us was celebrating the symbolic African achievement, he was absolutely unimpressed. He just said, you know, they just got help from the Europeans, they don't really know how to do these things. And he said, you know, us blacks, we don't know how to run a government. You white people, you know, you know how to do it, but us, we will never get it right. So. You can sense that a lot of things need to go really wrong before people start being nostalgic for truly terrible times like that. Um, Ten years ago in May 2000, The Economist had its cover story, Africa, the hopeless continent. It's the shape of Africa, there was a man with a gun inside of it. Right? And the whole, the whole story of, of the whole magazine was just, let's just nuke the place. I mean, there's war, there's famine, there's conflict, they're useless. Nothing's ever going to come from it. Nine years later, Economist title with Africa again. It was a kid flying an Africa shaped kite and said, Africa rising. As stupid as any generalizations about Africa are, because there's a lot of countries in Africa, they were onto something. Africa is starting to, many African countries are starting to kind of grow. The young people are coming back um, and starting to contribute to their countries. And so that's where I see myself and the role of my generation coming into. It's not uh, a white man's burden kind of thing or a savior complex. Uh, savior complex, because you know my country doesn't need saving; it needs citizens who come and show up and do some work. So, what's going to happen is that quite likely in the future I'll be working at a government agency, writing some policy, and that might sound dry to some people, but to me it's the most fascinating thing in the world, because for most people their nation is kind of an abstract thing. You know, if I tell you what does America stand for. There'll be slightly different answers, but there's a couple of things that people associate with, let's say, America, right? There's this nation that is abstract and it's distance from you. For my generation, it's quite the opposite. There's nothing abstract about our nationhood. If I want to make a Namibian identity how I want to, I can do that. If you want to change what America means, you're going up against centuries um, of things that have come before you. you know, there's this crushing weight of history that you need to surmount before you can write your own narratives. My generation, we are literally making a nation from scratch, and it's really exciting. I mean, every time I come back, I go back home, all the street names have changed, and it's a little detail, but it's the most visible sign of someone trying to say, what are, what are we on? What are our priorities? You know, who do we name our, our monuments, our streets after? And so, just like that, everything else is still in flux, you know, from the most basic institutions to what we see ourselves as, what we value. Me and my generation, we get to decide all of that. So, uh, our born free generation, we were tasked with birthing this nation, carrying it through the difficult times of adolescence where we're at now, and hopefully into a prosperous future. It's going to be monumentally difficult and a tremendous challenge, but it's also a chance to directly write history 
And I, as well as my born three brothers and sisters, can't wait to start writing. I like the moment you described where you met um, the fellow South African expat, um, and you immediately jumped to the point that you know you felt critical <laughs> of how people have been leaving your country and you know not returning or you know helping the country that supported them. But was there any self-criticism being a student in another country at the time? And, Right. You didn't necessarily have your life plan. Would you, were you thinking about staying here? Well, it was a bit of an epiphany on the slow burner. It, it took me a while to kind of get around to that. So first I was like, well, you're an asshole. And then I started, you know, thinking, well, I'm here, so I better just make sure that I also go back once I've got it. Because the education is great, um, better than what I could get there. But the idea is to use it in a productive way and go back, yeah. rather than just you know, get a good lifestyle over here. Um, I'm interested mostly in issues of uh, good governance and basic poverty reduction. So at the lowest, most abject poverty, how do we just get that a bit better? Um, that's the most direct and useful changes you can make in, in the short term. Yeah. Did you consider um, like centering this talk <coughs> under any other aspect of your life? And why did you choose like your country as this, this sort of um, center point of it? Well, I, I think it, it defines me more than anything else. Uh, and that's partly just living here, you get to realize that, that that's, you know, coming into a different country, you start defining yourself by your country. Um, but also, I've just been obsessed more and more with the idea of, of how I'm literally as old as my country, or almost. Um, you know, I'm as old as my country, and so we're very intertwined, our histories. And so I just, it's an idea that I think is interesting and useful. So the, the perception that you just talked about um, came out of your time at, at Dickinson and in the U.S. Is there anything else about or other you know, piece about understanding yourself or your country that came out of either your time in the U.S. or your time at Dickinson in particular? I don't know. <laughs> I had a couple weeks to prepare for this, so <laughs> I might have to get back to you on that. <laughs> How did you want to do that? Uh, Collegeport.com. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to go to America, and this was one of the first things that came up. And, uh, they gave me financial aid, and the slideshow looked pretty. So. <laughs> did you know when you decided to go to college in the U.S. that you were eventually going to try to come back? Um, I mean, I, I, I love my country partly just because it's physically stunning. So I, uh, I think eventually I was going to come back, but. I definitely at some younger stage of my life the thought was I'm gonna retire. It wasn't I'm gonna go back there to contribute in sort of areas. At some point I'm gonna come back and just appreciate the spread. Um, so yeah, that, that's definitely more a more recent development. Do you think that people of your generation have kind of that same sentiment that they wanna go and maybe learn somewhere else and then come back? I, I think I think that seems to be happening more increasingly. Back in the day they used to get the education, just get the hell out of there. Um, whereas now more and more people do have at least the idea that they want to. Um, so since you're kind of the first generation, like now going back to Namibia when you're home, <coughs> what is what do you see in kind of the younger generations, um, like other than you, and like what 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 do you see as like their sense of identity and being Namibian? Do you right. see it kind of being more formulated now that there's been more time? There's definitely a, a generational cut. The older people, and, and this, this pertains especially to, to race relations, the older generation, uh, especially of whites, luckily my family doesn't fall into that, but um, a lot of them tend to be quite racist and quite set in their ways like that, whereas there's a lot more um, of a, of a, a lot less tension with the younger generation. So there's more of an actual idea of seeing yourself as a Namibian with younger people than with, with a lot of Germans will call themselves Southwesterners rather than the um, that's how they'll see themselves because they, they want the old days back. Um, whereas we see our, ourselves more united. Um, is, so you talked about like your generation having this perception. That is this a, is this, when you say that, is that like the conversation you have amongst your friends? Like is it a common topic or is it something more like you just see other people your own age uh, heading in this way and having these conversations naturally? I mean both, but yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely a topic of discussion. This born free generation, like mm -hmm. I mentioned, it's, it's 
Um, it's, it's a quite commonly used, used phrase. Um, so there's definitely that, that sense that we're the ones who are going to have to get stuff done.